Um, so we're going to start this series now that is about quantifying the divine in terms of the behaviors of believers. So knowing who Allah is and how to best be close to Him and have a relationship with Him through living out His message. And the scholars identified that knowing His divine attributes, knowing His intimate details that He has given us about Himself is the key uh, to one's worship. And we know that because the Qur'an tells us, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا So he says, uh, God has all of the most beautiful attributes, so call upon him by them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, الدُّعَاءُ هُوَ الْعِبَادَةِ That prayer, supplication, is the essence and the core of worship. And so, to know his qualities and descriptions and attributes that he has defined himself by, and then to naturally call upon him by those. So like when you're making a prayer, we know that we've reached a level of spirituality and, and knowledge of meaning and purpose that we can attach a specific quality and trait, like we'll call upon him by the most generous when we are in need of something. You see what I'm saying? When we are struggling with the impurities and the struggles of life, we can call upon Him by the Most Holy and Quddus or by the pure and perfection of As-Salam, for example. So these are the type of things that we want to learn. And that's kind of the intrinsic meaning of وَمِنْ مَنْ So among our creation are people who are guided with the truth and they live their life in a balance of justice and fortitude and clarity as a result of knowing that truth. And so many scholars identify that the ultimate truth is Allah, whom al haq that is his name. That is a description and attribute by which he defines himself. All truth is derived from him. All truth is because of him. And he created the heavens and earth with truth. The purpose and meaning for which things exist is according to him. This is why Sheikh al-Sha'arawi, the great mufassir of the recent uh, century, if you'll notice, most of the time when he would be talking about him, he would say, Al-Haqqu Subhana, Al-Haqqu Subhana. He would always refer to him as the truth. Glory be to him in his perfection. So in the end of Surah Al-Hashar, we hear a lot. We're guided um, to prepare for the Day of Judgment. What we put forth in our deeds and how we are preparing for that day when we'll be held accountable. And then he reminds us, don't be like those who forgot Allah and then they forgot themselves. Because if you don't know who God is and you are not truly connected to Him through how He has revealed Himself to you, then you really can't know yourself. And you really can't uh, be a reformer in a process of repentance and turning back to Him uh, if you don't know who He is in the first place. And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he highlighted this point. Billahi tis'an wa tis'ina isma man ahsaha dakhla jannah. That God has ninety-nine attributes. Whoever would account for <coughs> whoever would account for them uh, would go to heaven. And so that's why after that part of the end of Surah Al-Hashr, that's why he, after he says, you know, you should prepare for the day of judgment, you should remember Allah and the Qur'an is this beautiful, powerful book with all of you. Then he goes into a litany of a list of his descriptions and attributes and qualities, telling you if you know these things, if you know these qualities about him, then you will be one who is ready for death when it comes, because that will affect who you are and how you live. So that's actually the widespread understanding of the scholars on the hadith, that there are 99 qualities and attributes of God, whoever accounted for them will go to heaven, not whoever just memorized them. Uh, heaven is, is something that people work for by proving themselves that in my flaws as a created being who is finite and who is subject to struggles, something that Allah is not, right? I constantly, through Allah, I'm purifying myself of my weaknesses and shortcomings, and by Him and knowing Him, my path is clear to refining and purifying myself through Him. 
And so that's what that meaning is. So there's a few weak hadiths that list 99 qualities. Um, none of those are authentic. Those are the basis you see the, the, the plaques that we put up. Uh, they're beautiful. And, you know, those are all mentioned in the Quran and the hadith. So it's not like they're just because it's a weak hadith doesn't mean those are all wrong and we should throw them out as a bid'ah or something like this. No. Uh, but what we do know is that we can't say that those are officially because they have different narrations. Each weak hadith has different descriptions. They're in agreement on about 80% of them, it's a large majority, but some of them are different. And so many of the scholars said, actually, um, I think it was Ibn Taymiyyah, actually went ahead and looked through the Quran and Sunnah and listed all of the attributes and came well over 100, like 130 some odd, that he could find himself. And there's a famous narration where, that is authentic that you always hear the end part of it. Allahumma ja'al al-Qur'an al-Azim wa Rabi'a The beginning of that is, Oh Allah, I'm calling you by your descriptions that you have taught me or that you have informed someone or if you've kept it in your knowledge. So the scholars have said, we cannot limit. It is wrong for us to limit the divine attributes to 99. So here's where the culture and the religion kind of have conflicted because the culture, it's not that it's evil or wrong or bad, but it took the hadith about the 99 and made it in the minds of people that there are only 99 descriptions of God. No, saying there happen to be among them there are 99 that if we knew them and understood them, then that means we will be guided to the straight path because we will be embodying, right? There's a weak hadith that is very useful in this, that تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ right? uh, Make sure that your behavior is reflecting that which we know about God. And so the more what you know about Him affects who you are, the more you are close to him and his slave and servant. Um, so um, there's a whole debate among the scholars about something called Ismullah al-A'zam. Okay, Ismullah al-A'zam. This is the greatest name of God. Many scholars in history said that hadith is weak and the one that's authentic about it, it seems to conflict and it's a waste of our time to go trying to figure out mysteries just like Alif Lam Mim and these things, right? They're saying it's it's not something that's really been established by Tawatur, right? It's not a very well established concept. Some other scholars debate it and they literally have a dozen different descriptions that they say. You know, some said it's Allah, some said it's Al Hayyul Qayyum, some said it's uh, Al Ahad, some said, and they have all of these Rabb and Rahman, and there's all these opinions which tell us that it's just something that. Um, actually, one scholar uh, pointed out something that I felt made a lot of sense, kind of like Laylatul uh, Qadr, right? That depending on your heart's sincerity, that Allah can take whatever you're praying to Him by when you use His descriptions and qualities, that He will see you have called upon Him by the greatest, particularly if you're using a attribute that is relative to the prayer that you're making, meaning your prayer is so sincere and your knowledge of Him and your seeking Him is so sincere that you're able to relate, as we said in the beginning, His qualities and descriptions to what exactly it is that you're praying for, you see? And so that's where, that's where that kind of solves that there's conflicting narrations about in this uh, prayer or in this ayah or in this surah is Ismul al-Azam and then it's different from the other one. So how could that be? Um, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's another one. Now all attributes according to the Qur'an are the same. And that's in the end of Surah Al-Isra. قُلْ إِدْعُوا اللَّهَ أَوْ إِدْعُوا الرَّحْمَانَ أَيَّمْ مَا تَدْعُوا لَهُ فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى So he says, call upon him as God or call upon him as the merciful. Whichever one you call upon him by, he has all of the beautiful attributes, which tells us that Allah and Ar-Rahman are the same to him. You see? And that's where, you know, giving a hierarchy of divine attributes is somehow demeaning to him. He is perfect in all of his qualities and attributes, and all of his qualities and attributes equally define him. So now we'll go into the actual, because today we'll start by talking about the word Allah. And so um, Allah is something dear and special to Muslims, but it's important for us to know the background of this word and to what it represents and how we are supposed to relate to it and communicate it to others. This is a very key point because I'm going to say that the widespread culture of Muslims 
is quite different from what you find in the actual scholarly uh, historical text of this word. So the word, if we look into its background, if you go into all of the classic linguists and Misan al-Arab and al-Ghani and al-Sahah and all of those historical linguists, they all have a general agreement that this word comes from two words in Arabic, al and ilah. And so al is the definitive article in Arabic, which means the, meaning not a something. So in Arabic, if I say kitabun, and I put tanween at the end, without al, then it means a book, meaning any old book, right? But if I say al-kitab, it means the book. We're talking about a specific book that we know about. You see what I'm saying? So they said that the Arabs have this word ilah, which means something worshipped or something deified. Something that people have associated to be some supernatural power. It's worship, it's worthy of prayers and, and devotion, right? So anything like that. So when they wanted to define the creator supreme being, they put al on there, al-ilah. But because the Arabs like, you know, the facilitation of easy speech, they dropped the Hamza, the E, the E, the Hamza got dropped. And so was, instead of al ila it was Allah, you see? So that's how this word was formed. And so because of that clarity, we know that this is the work of the Arab people in their anthropology and their history of working out how to make a word like that. So based upon that, you have the vast majority of linguists who studied Arabic language and its history, they're all saying that this cannot be seen as like some ancient word in the heavens that all prophets used or knew, and is the ancient description like, like I'm John, like people are thinking of it like that's Allah. They're saying, no, this is a word, it's a description of the divine, something that's worshipped and the one and only thing that is worthy of worship. So the name in and of itself carries that. So when it says, وَلَئِن سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُونَ Allah. There was some confusion amongst the Arabs about the word Allah and what it meant and what it indicated in the time of the Prophet So they were saying that God is the creator, right? Allah to them is this creator entity. But in the Arab mindset, when the Prophet ﷺ was receiving revelation, they did not see Allah as some intimate, close entity to them. They saw Allah and Uzza and Baal and Hubal. They saw those as the intimate God that they have. They saw these aliha, these idol, these idols, as something that they would go for daily prayer and daily needs and wants and feeling of connection. And Allah was like this distant creator figure. This figure that is not close to them, that is not something that they would go to. Something that caused the Kaaba to be built. And so then the Aliha is the, what we gain the value of this intimate divine ship through these idols that we worship, right? And so God was going back to make the point to them by saying, you know, if, if you ask them who is the creator, they will say Allah. So the Arabs understood Allah to be the creator. And so um, this is where in English the word God um, is known to be with a capital G is the supreme being, the creator, the source of monotheistic faith. But when you look at the lowercase g, God, and you look in the dictionary, anything that is worshipped or deified. So it's literally the exact same difference between the word ilah in Arabic, which is lowercase g-o-d, and Allah, which is uppercase g-o-d. And so it does not make sense. This is where the confusion and you know, people hearing an Ahmad Dida point or Yusuf Estes in his simple presentation of things without going back to all of the, the actual knowledge. They're saying, you know, God is a word that can be done like this and that and the other. Yeah, you can do that with lowercase g. You can put goddess or gods, right? But you can't do that with the uppercase. It doesn't make sense because it's the supreme being, the one and only, the, the the creator, the omnipotent, the omniscient, the omnipotent. That's how it's described in the lexicon, right? Those are two different things. Monotheists are capital G-O-D. The, the, the spirit worshippers and the idol worshippers of the world in English um, use the lowercase G-O-D, G-O-D because they have goddess and all of those things that they add to it. So there is really no difference between... So for example, if you go to any Arab country, uh, whether it's Palestine or Syria or Egypt or whatever, and you find Arabs there. 
if you have not been there and you're not an Arab, you may think that there is no Christians there. When in fact there are millions of Christians there. And they have churches with big giant crosses and they believe in the Trinity. And so if you go into their church and you listen to a sermon, you're going to hear them referring to Allah over and over and yet they're defining him as an Ab wal Ibn wal Ruh al Qudus. Right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Allah is known as these three things to them. Right? So you're not solving this debate by using an Arabic word. You see my point here? That's what we, in our minds, we're coming here, let's tell these people about Allah because the God means this and that to them. Well, Allah means this and that to them back where you came from. So this is not solving the problem. So the Quran is being sent for us to learn how to define God to people. Like Allah, in their mind, was not an intimate, close being who He is, and He cannot and will not resurrect people after they die. Like that was a strong belief among Arabs. Right? So the Quran, God is coming down to explain to them, no, Allah is something very different than what you think He is. He didn't, but now what, if Allah wanted to, He could have just said He's Yahweh, and then made it this thing that the Hebrews have, you know, and then introduced that to them, saying, well, there's people before you who stay pure in their belief in God, right? And so this is the name that I've given to them. So, like, for sure, there is no way anyone would ever believe if you know history of peoples and religion that Moses or Jesus would have called God Allah. They would not have done that. Neither any other prophet. Because this word only exists in Arabic. In the Hebrew you have Elo, or Elohim is the way they constantly, that's their general way. It's the sister word of Hebrew to Allah. But it's not Allah. It doesn't have Shadda and it does not have the Elif. It's Elo. Right? And then if you go into Aramaic, it's a little bit closer. It's Alaha, like that. So if you go into the Aramaic lexicon and those who study Aramaic as a scholarly discipline, they will say that Jesus would have called God Alaha, but not Allah. There would always there would be no shud, no shadda on the land, and there would be uh, no sukun at the hat. The hat would always have a fatha on it, alaha. Right? So that would be how he would have uh, referred to him, right? And so being that the Quran tells us that there were prophets sent in every single nation, وَلَقَدَ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطاغوت. I remember one time a brother was trying to convince me that Adam and Eve were speaking Arabic, and I was like, well, what makes you think that? He's like, because in the Quran, قَالَ Adam, And I was like, so when it says قَالَ فِرْعَوْنِ, you think he was speaking Arabic as well? You know, so this something that happens. By the way, we have to be careful because this is what happened with the Jewish people. Like they think that God is a Hebrew entity, and Hebrew is the language of heaven, and Hebrew is the language of Adam and Eve. They have this same ethnocentricizing, bringing God down to a culture or a tribe or a language on this earth and limiting him to something that is earthly and created. Like language as we speak it here, is that created or not created? It was created. You see what I'm saying? And so this is where people get kind of a little bit too much into the actual literal substance rather than the very um, mystical essence. When we say mystical, we're not supporting some hocus pocus religion, but you have to admit spirituality in its fullness is very mystical. We all have experiences that we really can't explain to anyone in our life. We can try to. It, depending on if that person is embracing their spiritual side or not, okay, they will understand or not in a general context. But you can't really put a pinpoint on exact. Just like, like for example, when somebody's staring at you from behind. You know, I, one time the brother came to me and he says, "You know, I mean, we're supposed to believe in the evil eye and all of that. And, you know, I, I don't see that. I didn't read that in the Quran. It seems kind of, you know, hocus pocus to me. It seems like some sort of uh, mythology." And I said, "But brother." You have always in your life on many occasions felt that somebody's staring at you and you look back and then they see you and they try to look away because they know you caught them staring at them, right? But how did you know? They're behind you. How did you see them staring at you? Did you hear them staring at you? Did you feel them staring at you? But feel we, t we understand is like touching the skin. These nerves need a skin touch for you to feel. But you felt them from away looking at you. You knew that you felt their eyes coming to you and nowhere else, right? And that's something you can't explain. 
You see what I'm saying? And there's many examples of this, right? So we don't want to limit God to like something that's like finite or something worldly. We want to keep him as above and beyond all of that. Wallahu Akbar. So when you go into the, the actual linguist lexicons of the Arabic language and the word Allah, they say, Al-Ma'bud, Al-Ladi Yastahibta Taqarrub Ilayhi Bi Mukhtalif Al-Su'al Min Ajli Nail Ridah. So if you go into the definition of the word Allah, the worshipped entity, that which is deserving of worship, that's actually what the word means. It's a word with a meaning. It's not just like a, a mysterious name that we do. It's just like I'm John and you know she's Khadija or whatever. You know, um, it's it's a it's a word with meaning. So that's what it is in Surah Al An'am. Wahuallahu fi samawati wal ard. So some people are looking at that like this means his name is Allah. In that, no, what it means is he is the one entity. Back to your point. That anywhere in the universe, there are people who worship him, right? So every culture on planet Earth has a word for the supreme being who's the creator. Every culture has that. But not every culture has a word for, what is it, uh, Rama or whatever it is. What do they have in India, you know? You know not every word, every culture does not have a word for Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Not every word, every culture has a word for the different idols and deities people have invented. You see what I'm saying? But every single being on earth that is an intellectual being has a word that refers back to the supreme being. And they hold that as a sacred holy thing. You see what I'm saying? And so every angel and every being in the universe, that's why when people say, what are after the saying there's aliens coming? You know, I thought there was like, so is that halal? I don't know what do you mean halal. If God wants to create aliens, surely he will create them. And if they're intellectual, he will send them prophets and he will teach them about himself. Right? He creates things you don't know about. So don't limit him. Don't be like, well, because we only see things. That's like kind of an atheist mentality. So I don't see it, so it can't be there. Like, who decided that for you? Like, you know. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with there being aliens if there is aliens, right? If that's the case, then, you know, we'll need to work together to worship God. And they probably have a different word that they refer to him uh, by. So, Surah Al-Ikhlas and Surah and ayat Al-Kursi. If we want to know who is God by God's own definition, that's where you go. So, I would highly encourage all of you to make sure that you spend a good number of hours in the future, reading the commentaries and the explanations of Ayatul Kursi and Surah Al Ikhlas. Because you can. And you can literally spend hours on this. There is a very beautiful, deep, great definition of who exactly God is, so that we can carry that in any conversation with anyone. And by the way, when you have that, and I found it time and time again, when you have these as your reference points, and not necessarily these uh, logical points, some people feel like, you know, just stick with the logic to talk to the person. If they're trying to argue logic at the point, but if you want somebody who's actually looking for God, that will get them. Like Ayatul Kursi and Surah Al-Khas, those definitions, if someone is asking about and they're curious and they're looking for God and they want to know who God is, those will bring them in and make them strong. They will feel like, I'm, that makes sense. I'm going with that. That's something that's natural to me to believe. The Prophet Sallallahu defined his mission to us as In another narration, Salih al-Akhlaq. That my whole purpose for being sent as your messenger was to give and complete, to give a complete good model of character, the best of qualities of character. So of course, what can be the best qualities of character? Asma Allah al-Husna. Those are the best qualities. So what is it? Al ism al musamma. This is what we understand. So the what you may think the word ism means uh, name, but in Arabic we have three qualities. You have ism, fa'al, and harf. Everything, every word in Arabic is one of three categories. You have ism, fa'al, and harf. So ism we understand is like noun, a describing word that's not related to an action happening in time. You see what I'm saying? Because a verb is an action that happens either in the past, present, future. You see? And so that is a verb, an action. But the noun is what is describing something, right? And so um, in English, we think of nouns and adjectives as separate things. In Arabic, those are the same. They're just two categories of one thing, right? They're two different types of one category. 
right? So the Prophet ﷺ is coming to give us an example of the best qualities. So the Prophet ﷺ embodied this Aisha anha. If you go back to the hadith, there's some weak hadith that says that she just basically told somebody, Kana khulquhu al Quran, just like that, and they simplify. But actually what happened was is that Sa'd ibn Hisham was a tabi'i. And he came to Aisha and he said, Oh mother of the believers, can you describe for us and inform us about the behavior and character of the Prophet? ﷺ? And her response actually was in the authentic hadith on Sahih Muslim was, Alista taqra al Quran. Don't you read the Quran? We said, Yeah, of course. He said, Fakana khuluquhu al Quran. So she said, he, The way his behavior was, was the Quran walking around, right? So what we're learning is that the Quran is that like foundational document of behavior. You see what I'm saying? How should we be? What are the attitudes? that lead the attitudes, the mentalities, the, the disposition of spiritual nature that lead to words and actions. You see, that's what the Qur'an is. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the best example possible for any human being to live that out. So the Sunnah is the commentary of the Qur'an in its best form. Right? If you don't know what the Qur'an is teaching, watch, read about the hadith of the Prophet, study his sirah and how he engaged and what he did and what his priorities were and how he reacted and so forth. So this, uh, that brings us to the Prophet وسلم, his noble quality that Allah calls him by mostly in the Qur'an, which is what? Abd. Abd. The most noble quality. And it goes back to what does Allah mean? Al-Ma'bud. You see? So, the word Allah means the worshipped entity, right? And so the Prophet وسلم, his description, Subhana Ladi Asra bi Abadihi, right? Alhamdulillah Ladi Anzal al Kitab ala Abadihi, right? And uh, uh, he Anzal uh, Anzal Furqan ala Abdi. And there's many, many different ayahs where he refers to him as his servant. And that is his slave. And you should not feel shy to call him a slave. So the qualifying characteristic when the Prophet ﷺ was asked about how we should testify, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Wa na rasuluhu wa abduhu. Because scholars said that a tartib you feel the ma'na. That when there's an order, it means something. Meaning your qualification to carry this message to others, a rasul, a messenger must be that you are truly his servant. How could you be a servant to a master you don't know and you are not understanding what he is expecting out of you? So that's where we as people, if we're not reading this Quran as the Prophet ﷺ was reading the Quran to the best of our ability, then we will not be truly servants of God. We will not be his slaves. We will not be embodying his message. And so when the people were starting to uh, talk about the Prophet ﷺ in some exaggerated fashion, uh, kind of sounding like he's the light of God on earth, he said, "Let to truly come out of the Nasara, be Isa ibn Maryam. For inna ma ana abduhu, for kulu Abdullah Rasul." So then, the Prophet Sallam corrected people who are exaggerating. By the way, this is what we call it the Dalal and the Buwa. Because if you're a false prophet and people are agreeing to exaggerate you as more than you've defined yourself, you'll jump on that, right? Uh, the Prophet Sallam was humble. He said, "Look, I'm just the servant of God. Say the servant of God and His messenger." Right? Be very clear with people about it. So servanthood is the best. So if we go into what it means to be a servant, we go back to the word ibadah, which means worship, right? But see, a lot of times people just think of ibadah, the secularism goddess. You're thinking of what? Some guy who reads Quran or some lady who's praying raka'at of salah and doing dhikr on dhikr beats and this is ibadah. Outside of that, we have our job and our work and our family and all these other responsibilities. We don't see that as ibadah. Right? But the agreed upon definition of ibadah is each and everything you do or say seeking the pleasure of God. So whatever you do in your life, looking to please God, you are going to be rewarded as an act of worship. Even if it's, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, I'm just going to go ahead and give you a, it's not an extreme example, it seems like it. So when the Prophet Sallallahu a man asked him, he said, if I am having physical relation with my wife, do I give good deeds for that? And he said, yeah. Isn't it if you went and had relation with someone that's not your wife, you get a sin? He said, so being with your wife is an act of obedience. And so you will give the words of good deeds if you're doing it for a sin. Which is why the Prophet used to make a prayer before 
he had this relation with his wife. But how many of us see it as an act of worship? Or how many of us are bringing ourselves down to like a, a basic desire fulfillment uh, thing, right? And I think that part goes mostly to men than women. And so this is where we uh, have to refine how we see anything that we do. You see, um, you know, like the Prophet was mentioning Allah while naked with his wife. You see what I'm saying? How many cultures see that as za'ib? You see what I'm saying? That's where, that's where we need to rethink how we think things and who is deciding for us how we look at stuff. You see what I'm saying? Um, so, um, a slave is not only a slave sometimes. A slave is always a slave to the master. You see what I'm saying? So, the concept of slave to master is the slave is a good slave if it knows and respects and is humbly submissive to the master. Right? This one owns me. I am the property of it. So, Truly, we reveal to you this scripture, this book with the truth. So, worship God in sincerity in your religion. Meaning, everything you do should be an act of religion. Do not narrow your scope. Don't make Allah limited to a small part of your life. Right? If you're at work, you should see yourself as a representative of Allah. You see what I'm saying? You're here with his message, carrying it to the people around you. You should be consciously aware of that. And that's Ihsan. That's the highest level of worship. That's the highest level of spirituality. That you're worshiping God as though you can see him. If you feel like you can't, if you're not worshiping him like that throughout your day, and you're only relegating that to small parts, it's like so many people come to me and I just, I can't handle it. So, brother, you know, can I do a combination of prayers when I get home from work? How many hundreds of people have brought this to me? And I said, why? He's like, well, I, you know, I'm at work. Meaning that there can be no prayer at work. And I said, but is that a law they have made there? Because you know that's against the Constitution of the United States. And they're like, well, you know, I don't think it would be acceptable. And I said, who decided that for you? Where is this, you know? And so this is some attitude that we don't need or we should. Like, brother came to me yesterday and he's wanting someone to become Muslim. And then he said, I said, you know, I never saw you at Jummah. I said, oh, I'm not able to go to Jummah. And he's wanting a friend of his to become Muslim. He does not come to Jummah. And so, this is, the, I'm telling that's how I became Muslim, by the way. There's a guy who does not even know where the mosque is, who's telling me about Islam in the year 1998 at the mosque. I've never saw him pray once. And he's like, yeah, Islam is right, you know. And it's like, what does Islam mean to you? It's an argument because you have some good theological things you were born to know about, right? But it, how are we going to be his messenger? We are meant to be the messenger of Allah, meaning in the general context, not the specific picture as a special person. But we are all, but we have to be Abdul first. And so we have to carry this worship with us. Meaning your whole existence, every part of your day, every minute, every hour should be reflecting. And again, some people start to think, but that's too much. We're not saying that means all day you're praying rakahs and doing dhikrs or dhikr beads or something like that. That's a secular, weird, under, I don't know who invented I, I do know who invented that, but it wasn't us. But somebody gave that to us from the outside, and we've accepted that that's what that means. I have to sit there reading Quran all day to be worshipping him all day. No, you have to be conscious of him, remembering him, seeking his forgiveness when you see evil, when you feel evil, when you think of evil. That you are remembering him, that you are trying to live in a way that is pleasing to him everywhere you go. Yes. So that's also represented in like how he has a du'a for everything he does, but he intentionally mentions du'a, not like just in mind. Exactly. If you look at his daily regimen, there was no human being that we know of that was so entrenched in dealing with things and mentioning God and thinking of God and praying to God and, and having these glorifications and praises throughout the day. Like literally Aisha was not exaggerating. She said, right? He was always mentioning his Lord in all situations. Whether Janaba or this or that or the other, he was always mentioning God. Right? So this is the attitude we need to carry if we're going to carry this, inshallah.